Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of Coding Adventures. Today I'd like to try and render some text, since it's one of those things that I always just take for granted. To begin with, we're going to need a font, and I've just grabbed the first one I found on my hard drive, which happens to be JetBrains Mono Bold. So let me open that up in a text editor just to see what's inside, and not unexpectedly, the raw contents is highly unilluminating. So we're going to need to find some kind of guide for decoding it. This is a TTF for True Type Font File, which is a format I'm told developed by Apple in the late 1980s, and so I had a look on their developer website and located this reference manual. Hopefully it's nice and simple to understand. Okay, I've been skimming through it a little, and I'm becoming increasingly baffled and bewildered by all the mysterious diagrams, the long lists of arcane bytecode instructions, not to mention the strange terminology such as freedom vectors, ploop values, and twilight zones. What is the twilight zone? It is the middle ground between light and shadow. You're not helping. Anyway, after slowing down a bit and reading more carefully, I realized that most of this complexity is focused on a single problem, which is making sure the text is displayed or printed clearly at low resolutions, where unlucky scaling could cause one part of a letter to appear twice as thick as another, for example, making the letters difficult to read. So I don't think it's actually something we need to worry about for our little experiment today at least, which is definitely a relief. Let's move on then to the next section of the manual which gives us this list of mandatory tables that all fonts need to include. And I'm most excited about this glyph table, since that sounds like where the shapes are stored. So our first goal is simply to locate that table. And this looks promising. The font directory is a guide to the contents of the font file. Music to my ears. So this is the very first block of data we'll encounter in the file. And I don't think we really care about any of it except for the number of tables. So we're going to want to skip over one 32-bit integer, and then read in this 16-bit integer. And here's some quick C-sharp code for doing exactly that. I'm printing out the number of tables here by the way, just to make sure it's a plausible value, which from the tables listed in the manual I'm thinking would be somewhere between the mandatory 9 and around 50 at a maximum maybe. So let's run this quickly, and we can see the number of tables is 4,352. How am I doing something wrong already? Okay, I finally found the answer on this OS dev wiki entry, which is that the file format is big endian, which just means that the individual bytes of each value are stored back to front from what my little endian computer is expecting. So I've quickly made this simple font reader class, which lets us read in a 16-bit value, and have this conversion to little endian happen behind the scenes, so we don't need to worry about it every time. Alright, so using that, let's try running the program again, and now the number of tables comes out as 17, which is much more believable. That means we can proceed to the table directory, and what this gives us is a four-letter identifying tag for each table, and we've briefly seen what those look like already. And along with that, there's also the table's location in the file, in the form of a byte offset. So in the code, I've just added this little loop over the total number of tables, and in there, it's simply reading in the metadata for each of them. Of course, I've also had to expand our reader class in the process, with these two new functions for actually reading a tag and a 32-bit integer. So hopefully this is going to work. Let's try running it. And these tags look a little strange. For example, we seem to have a tiny head over here with a big question mark next to it which does incidentally sum up how I'm feeling right now. Oh, I just realized that I forgot to skip over all that other stuff in the first table that we didn't really care about. So let me just do that quickly. I think it was three 16-bit values, so that's six bytes we want to hop over here. All right, and now we've got the tables. I've spotted the glyph table entry over here, which is pointing us to byte location 35,436. So that's where we're headed next. Let's take a quick look at the manual first though, and it looks like the first bit of information we'll be given is the number of contours that make up the first glyph in the table. Interestingly, that value can be negative, which would indicate that this is a compound glyph made up of other glyphs, but let's worry about that later. We then have a bunch of 16-bit f-words, which tell us the bounding box of the glyph, 
and following that comes the actual data, such as these x and y coordinates here. I'm eager to get my hands on those, although we should take note that these coordinates are relative to the previous coordinate, so they're more like offsets I guess we could say. And they can also be in either an 8-bit or 16-bit format, which I assume these flags here are hopefully going to tell us. Then there's also an array of instructions, which I believe is the scary bytecode stuff we're skipping over. And finally, or I guess firstly, I'm not sure why I read this table backwards, we have indices for the endpoints of each contour. So if I'm understanding this correctly, we're going to read in a bunch of offsets from which we can construct the actual points, and then say we get two contour end indices, such as 3 and 6 for example, that just means that the first contour connects points 0, 1, 2, 3, and back to 0, while the second contour connects points 4, 5, 6, and back to 4. That seems easy enough, so the other thing to look at is that 8-bit flag value, although only 6 of the bits are actually used it seems. So we're going to have one of these flag values for each point, and according to the manual, bits 1 and 2 tell us whether the offsets for that point are stored in an unsigned 1-byte format, or a signed 2-byte format. Then getting just slightly convoluted here, bits 4 and 5 have two different meanings depending on whether the 1-byte or 2-byte representation is being used. In the first case, it tells us whether that byte should be considered positive or negative, and in the second case that's not necessary since the sign is included in the offset itself, and so it instead tells us whether or not we should skip the offset. That way, if the offset is 0, it doesn't have to actually be stored in the file. So we can see there's some basic compression happening here. On that note, let's take a look at bit 3. If this is on, it tells us to read the next byte in the file to find out how many times this flag should be repeated, so that it doesn't have to waste space storing repeated copies of the same flag. Finally, bit 0 tells us whether a point is on the curve or off the curve, and I'm not entirely certain what that means right now, but we can worry about it later. Let's first just get these points loaded in. By the way, to actually test if a particular bit in the flag is on or off, I'm using this tiny function here, which simply shifts all the bits over so that the bit we're interested in is in the first spot then masks it out, meaning all the other bits get set to 0, and finally checks if the resulting value is equal to 1. Alright, and then here's a function I've been working on for actually loading one of these simple glyphs, and this does exactly what we just talked about, it reads in the contour end indices, then reads in all of the flag values, of course checking each of them to see if they should be repeated some number of times, and finally reading in the x and y coordinates before simply returning all of that data. And for reading in the coordinates, I have another function here, where each coordinate starts out with the value of the previous coordinate, and then we grab the flag for this point, and depending on that, we either read in a single byte for the offset and add or subtract it, based on what the flag tells us to do, or we read in a 16-bit offset, but only if the flag isn't telling us to skip this one. Alright, I'm excited to see what comes out of this, so back over here I've just made a dictionary for mapping table tags to locations, which we can use to set the reader's position to the start of the glyph table, and then simply read in the first glyph, and print out its data. So let's see what that looks like quickly. Okay, that seems promising, but we won't really know if it's nonsense or not until we draw it. So in the Unity engine I've just quickly plotted these points, and I don't know what this is supposed to be, but I'm sure it'll become clear once we draw in the contours. Okay, it's looking a little dishevelled, but I do believe it's the missing character glyph. And I actually remember now reading that it's required to be at the very start of the glyph table, so that makes sense. I just need to iron out some bugs clearly, so I've been fiddling with the code a bit, and here's how it's working now. We simply loop over all the end indices, and then create this little window into the array, which allows us to access only the points in the current contour, since evidently I can't be trusted, and then we draw lines between those, looping back to the first point in the contour to close the contour at the end. Alright, let's try it out. And that's looking much better. One glyph is not enough though, I want all the glyphs. And to get them, we just hop over to the max p table, where we can look up the total number of glyphs in the font, and then we head over to the head table, leaping over several entries we don't care about right now, 
to find out whether the locations of the glyphs are stored in a 2-byte or 4-byte format. And finally, we can dive into the locate table, from which we can extract the locations of all of the glyphs in the glyph table. And then we can just read them in. I must admit, even though parsing a font file must be pretty low on the list of thrilling things one could do with one's day, I'm quite excited to see all these letters appearing here. Anyway, let's zoom in on one of these glyphs, such as the big B for instance, and we can see that while the glyphs are obviously very beautiful, they are perhaps a bit blocky. So I believe our next step should be to Bezier these bad boys. I've babbled about Beziers a bunch before on this channel, but briefly, if we have two points and want to draw a curve between them, we need at least one extra control point to control how the curve should curve. Now to visualize this curve, let's imagine a point starting out at the start point and moving at a constant speed towards this intermediate control point, from which a second point moves simultaneously towards the end point in the same amount of time that it takes the first point to complete its journey. Like this. That's not terribly interesting, but like many things in life, it can be made more exciting with the addition of lasers. So let's draw a laser beam between our two moving points. And that's a bit better already. But for some added flair, let's then also leave a ghost trail of the old beams behind. And now we're really getting somewhere. So the curve that these beams trace out is our Bezier curve. And all we need now is a way to describe this curve mathematically, which is surprisingly easy to do. We just need to imagine one last traveling point, this one moving between the first two travelers, and also completing its journey in the same amount of time. Observing the path of this third point, we can see how it travels perfectly along our curve. So here's a little function to help calculate the positions of these points. It takes in both the start position and the destination, as well as a sort of time value, which can be anywhere between 0 and 1, as a measure of the progress of the journey. The point's position at the given time is then calculated as the start point, plus the offset that takes us from the start to the end point, multiplied by the time value. Then from this linear interpolation, we can build our Bezier interpolation, which just calculates these intermediate A and B points like we saw, and then interpolates between those to get the actual point along the curve at the current time. So if we want to draw one of these curves, one way to do it would be like this, simply chopping the curve up into a bunch of discrete points based on this resolution value, and then drawing straight lines between them. So just testing this out quickly, we can see that with a resolution of 1, we of course just have a straight line, 2 gives us the faintest idea of a curve, and from there it quickly starts to look pretty smooth. Anyway, let's go back to our blocky B now that we have Bezier's working, and I'll just quickly jump into the code here and modify it so that every set of three points in the contour now gets drawn as a curve. And let's take a moment to admire how that looks. Wait, what? This is not quite what I had in mind, but it looks kind of interesting, so let's try writing some text with it, and we can come back and fix it in a minute. So I've created a string here that says hello world, and we simply go through each character in that string, and of course to the computer each of these characters is just a number defined by the Unicode standard, and I'm using that number as an index into the array of glyphs that we've loaded in. We then draw each of these and add some hard-coded spacing between them, because I still need to figure out where they've hidden the actual spacing information. Alright, let's take a look at the result. The letter spacing is too small, so I'll just increase that quickly. But unfortunately, the text is still not particularly comprehensible. Clearly, the glyphs in the font are not in the same order as Unicode, which makes total sense actually, since different fonts support different subsets of characters, so there's never going to be a one-to-one -one mapping. Instead, the font file needs to include a character map to tell us which glyph indices map to which Unicode values. This part seems like a bit of a pain because there are nine different formats in which this mapping information can be stored, although I then read to my great relief that many of these are either obsolete or were designed to meet anticipated needs which never materialized. 
And reading a little further, it seems that 4 and 12 are the most important ones to cover, so I'm going to get cracking on those. Okay, here's the code I've written to handle those formats, and I'm not going to bore you with the details. As we talked about, all it's doing is looking up, in a slightly convoluted way, the Unicode value that corresponds to each glyph index. With that mapping information, we can now finally retrieve the correct glyphs to display our little hello world message. I really like how stylish some of these buggy beziers look. Perhaps this is the font of the future. Oh, and by the way, if you'd like to learn more about the beauty of bezier curves, I highly recommend a video called The Beauty of Bezier Curves, and it's equal to the continuity of splines. Right now though, let's see if we can fix this mistake that I've made. So first of all, we can see that here where there's supposed to be a straight line, this point is actually just controlling how the curve bends as it moves towards this next point here. So it looks like the glyphs aren't made entirely out of beziers, as I was kind of assuming, but rather have some ordinary line segments mixed in. Also, taking another look at the manual, it shows this example where we have a spline made up of two consecutive bezier curves, and what it's pointing out is that this shared point between the two curves is exactly at the midpoint between these two control points. This is typically where you'd want it to be, simply because if it's not at the midpoint, we can see that we no longer get a nice smooth join between the two curves, meaning the spline becomes discontinuous. And so what the manual recommends doing for these points that lie right in the middle is to save space by simply deleting them. As it puts it, the existence of that middle point is implied. So we're going to need to infer these implied points when we load the font. And I believe that that's where this on-curve flag that we saw earlier is going to come in handy. So in this example, points 1 and 2 would be flagged as off the curve, whereas points 0 and 3 would be on the curve. What we can do then is say that if we find two consecutive off-curve points, we'll insert a new on-curve point in between them. Also, just to turn everything into Bezier's for consistency's sake, let's also say that if we find a straight line segment, which would be two consecutive on-curve points, then we'll also insert an extra point in between them. Alright, so I've just been writing some code to handle that quickly, which, as we just talked about, simply checks if we have two consecutive on- or off-curve points, and if so, it inserts a new point in the middle. Here's a quick test to see if that's working as expected. So these are the on- and off-curve points that are actually stored within the font file for our letter B, and then here are the implied on-curve points that we've now inserted into the contours, as well as these extra points between the straight line segments to turn them into valid Bezier curves. With that, our code for drawing these curves finally works as expected. And just for fun, I made it so that we can grab these points and move them around to edit the glyphs if we want. Anyway, let's put this to the test quickly by drawing all the letters of the English alphabet. And these all seem to have come out correctly. So let's then also try the lowercase letters. And these are looking good too, except I notice that we're missing the I and the J. I guess they must be compound glyphs since we haven't handled those yet. And I think the idea is just that the dot would be stored as a separate glyph, and then the I and the J would both reference that instead of each having to store their own copy of it. So I've just spent some time implementing compound glyphs over here, and since these are made up of multiple component glyphs, essentially all we need to do is keep reading in each component glyph until we receive word that we've reached the last one. And all the points and contour end indices from those are simply squished together into a single glyph, which is returned at the end here. Then here's the function for actually reading in a component glyph, and this essentially just gives us the index to go and look up the data of a simple glyph. Although I'm wondering now if a compound glyph can contain other compound glyphs. I'll need to tweak this later if that's the case. But anyway, the simple glyph we've just read in can then be moved around, scaled or even rotated, if I had implemented that yet that is, to orient it correctly relative to the other components. And we can see that transformation being applied to the points over here. So with that bit of code, we can at last read in our missing i and j. And this has also unlocked a whole world of diacritics, since of course these all make use of compound glyphs as well, to save having loads of duplicate data.
Okay, we're making good progress, I think. So I'd like to start trying out some different fonts, just to see if they're working properly. Let's write a little test sentence here, such as the classic one about the fox and the lazy dog, or this one I came across concerning discotheques and jukeboxes. These are nice test sentences because of course they contain all the letters of the alphabet, which I learned today is called a pangram. Anyway, this is JetBrains model that we've been using, and I'm going to try switching now to maybe Open Sans. Alright, there's an issue with the size of the glyphs clearly, but I found this helpful scaling factor in the head table which should take care of that. And that's looking much better, but obviously the spacing is a little off. The problem is that this isn't a monospaced font like the one we had before, so our hard-coded spacing value is no longer going to cut it. After some routing around though, I unearthed this horizontal metrics table, which tells us how much space we need to leave after each glyph, which is known as the glyph's advance width. So here's some code for just reading in that information, and if we use those values, our text obviously looks a lot more sensible. Okay, I've just spent a little while refactoring and cleaning up the project because things were getting slightly out of hand. Let's quickly make sure that I haven't messed anything up in the process, and of course I have. Alright, I've tracked down the issue, so we're back on track. And now that we're able to write some words and display their outlines, let's finally figure out how to properly render the text. I guess the simplest solution would be to just increase the thickness of the lines until they turn into a solid shape. Alright, thanks for watching. Well, wait a minute, this is perhaps not the most legible approach, so we should maybe take some time to explore our options. For example, some years ago I wrote this little polygon triangulation script using an algorithm called ear clipping, and one idea might be to simply feed the points that we're currently using to draw the outlines into that, and get out a mesh for the computer to draw. This doesn't seem ideal though, because if we want the letters to be nice and smooth, we'll have to have lots of little triangles on the screen, which the computer might not particularly appreciate. So a much smarter mesh-based approach is presented in this paper on resolution-independent curve rendering. Basically, we triangulate a mesh of just the sort of straight line inner part of the glyph, and then render a single extra triangle for each of the curvy bits. So to be clear, for each Bezier curve on the contour, a triangle is simply being drawn like this. The trick now is to find some way to display only the section of the triangle that is inside of the curve, so that we can get a smooth result without having to add loads more triangles. To do this, we're going to need to think about what the shape of our Bezier curve actually is. And just eyeballing it, you might think it looks kind of parabolic, but let's have a look at our equation to be sure. Currently, we have this defined as three separate linear interpolations, which paints a nice geometric picture, but it's a little clunky mathematically. So I've quickly just written out these interpolations as one giant equation, and then simplified it a bit to arrive at this, which we can of course recognize as a quadratic equation. It's just this coefficient a times t squared, plus the coefficient b times t, plus a constant c. For that reason, this particular type of Bezier curve we're working with is called a quadratic Bezier curve, which confirms our parabolic suspicions. And we can maybe see this even better if we allow the lines to extend out past this 0 to 1 time interval. Now it is a little bit fancier than your standard parabola though, in that we can actually rotate it around. And that's just because our equation of course is outputting two-dimensional points, rather than a single value. We could break it down if we wanted into separate equations for the x and y components, and if we were to graph those, they would just be regular old non-rotated parabolas like this. So nothing mysterious here, if we move a point on the x-axis, we can see how that's reflected in the x-graph, and if we move a point on the y-axis, we can see how that's reflected in the y-graph. Alright, so I reckon we're ready now to think about this problem of how to fill in the region inside of the curve. That's kind of confusing when the curve is all rotated like this though, so let's just position the point so that it looks like a perfectly normal y equals x squared parabola. One way to do this is to put p1 at coordinates half comma zero, p0 at coordinates zero comma zero, and p2 at coordinates one comma one. 
And that indeed has given us this nice simplified case where the y values of the curve are equal to the square of the x values. So if we want to fill in this region inside the curve, that's very easy in this case because if the points on the curve are where y is equal to x squared, then obviously inside is just where y is greater than x squared. To actually draw this region though, we'll need a mesh and a shader. For the mesh, we can simply construct a triangle like we saw earlier out of the three Bezier points, and I'll give those points texture coordinates corresponding to the positions that we put the points in to get that simple y equals x squared parabola. Then in a shader we can get the interpolated x and y texture coordinates for the current pixel, and let's visualize the x value for now as red, which looks like this. And here's the y value as green. Then here's them both together. I actually find it a bit easier to see what's going on if we chop the values up into discrete bands by multiplying by 10 for example, then taking the integer part of that, and then dividing by 10. And now we can see our x and y values as a little grid here, instead of a continuous gradient. Of course, we can move our points around, and we can see how this grid gets transformed along with them, since again the shader automatically interpolates the texture coordinates to give us the value for the current pixel. In texture space though, things always just look like this, since these are the texture coordinates that we defined. So back in the shader, let's test for y being greater than x squared, and draw the results of that into the blue channel here. As hoped, that now fills in the curve, and what's more of course, it will also be transformed along as we move our points around. So we only really had to think about the simplest possible case, and by taking advantage of the way that shaders work, we get the rest for free. I thought that was a cool idea, so with that we can now go back to our mesh of just the straight lines of the glyph, then add in those triangles for all the curves, and then use this clever little idea to shade in just the parts inside the curve. Hang on, that's not quite right though. It looks like along the outside edge of the glyph where the points go in a clockwise order, everything is correct, but along the inside here where the points are now going counterclockwise, we actually want to fill in the opposite region of the curve. So in the shader, I've just quickly added this little parameter which will tell us the direction of the triangle, and we can flip the fill flag based on that. Then just testing that here, we can see that when the points are clockwise, we have the inside of the curve being filled, and when counterclockwise, the outside is now filled. And that seems to have fixed our problem here. So this is a pretty interesting way to render text, I think. But one potential problem with the approach is that Microsoft has a patent on the research. Skimming through it, it does seem though that it only covers the more complicated case of cubic Bezier curves, which is when the curves are defined by four points instead of the three that we're working with. So quite possibly it is actually okay to use. But I'm anyway curious to experiment with different ideas today, so let's put this one to the side for now. What if we instead simply took our old glyph meshes made out of ridiculous numbers of triangles, but say that we don't actually care about the triangle count because instead of rendering them to the screen, we pre-render all of them to a texture file. That way, we ultimately only need to render a single quad for each letter, and use a shader that just crops out the appropriate part of that texture atlas to display the letter we want. This would be nice and fast, but it does of course have some issues with scaling, We'd need to make our atlas truly gigantic if we want to be able to display large text, for example. Or alternatively, we could try using signed distance fields. In one of my old videos, we took this map of the Earth and wrote a little function to calculate the distance of every pixel to the shoreline, which could then be used for making a simple wave effect. So we could use that same code here to turn our image of glyphs into an image of glyph distances. A simple shader could then sample the distance, and output a colour if that distance is within some threshold, which looks like this. This scale is better than before because now the shader is blending between distances rather than hard on-off values. The outlines are a little lumpy, but I'm sure we could improve that with some refinements to the technique. 
These texture-based approaches are slightly annoying though, in the sense that it's not really practical to support all the characters in a font, because then the texture would be too large. So we always have to compromise on some subset in order to get good quality. And even still, the edges tend to have some obvious imperfections, at least if you're zooming unreasonably close to the text, and we tend to lose our nice crisp corners. With that said, I have seen some interesting looking research about using multiple colour channels to store additional information that can help to increase the quality quite a bit. So I would like to experiment with this at some point, because it's definitely an interesting technique. But for today, I'd prefer to render the text directly from the Bezier data, without any textures compromising the quality in between. So focusing on a single letter for a moment, let's imagine a grid of pixels behind it, and our goal is obviously to light up the pixels that are inside of the letter. Therefore, we need a way to detect whether a point is inside or not, and happily there's a very intuitive way to do this. Say we're interested in this point over here. All we need to do is pick any direction, and imagine a ray going out until it hits one of the contours of the shape. When it hits that contour, it must either be entering or exiting the shape. And if it's entering it, then of course it's bound to exit it at some point. But in this case, the ray doesn't hit any other contours along its journey, which means it must have been exiting the shape, and so obviously it must have started out inside of it. Now moving our point of interest back a bit into the b-hole here, for want of a better term, the ray now intersects with two contours along its path. From that, we can deduce it must have first entered the shape, and then exited it, and so clearly the starting point this time was on the outside. The simple rule we can gather from this is that if the number of intersections is even, we're outside the glyph, while if it's odd, we're inside of it. So all we really need to do is figure out the maths for calculating the intersection of a horizontal ray with a Bezier curve. For example, say we have this curve over here, and we want to figure out where this ray, at a height of 0.5, intersects with it. Since the ray is horizontal, we only need to care about the y values of the curve, so we're basically just asking where this function is equal to 0.5. Or equivalently, we could shift the whole curve down by 0.5, and then ask where the function is equal to 0. Conveniently, that's exactly the question that the quadratic formula is there to answer. So if we just take our equation for the y component of the Bezier curve, and plug the values for a, b, and c into the quadratic formula, we're going to get back the values of t, where the corresponding y value is 0. In this case, the t values come out as 0.3 and 1.2, and since values outside of the range 0 to 1 are not on the curve segment, that means that we'd count one intersection in this case. Alright, so here's some code implementing the quadratic formula, and one small detail here is that if a is 0, we get a division error. This is the case where the curve is actually a straight line. And so we can then solve it like this instead. Okay, now I've also written this little test just to see that this is working properly, and all it does is calculate the a, b, and c values from the positions of the Bezier points, and then it asks what the roots of that quadratic equation are, so where it's equal to 0, but first, the height of our horizontal ray is of course subtracted over here, like we saw earlier, to take its position into account. Then, assuming a solution exists, we just draw a point at that time value along the curve to visualize it, using this little function over here. So, let's see how it goes. I'm just going to grab some points and move them around a bit to see whether the intersection points look correct or not. It's maybe not the most rigorous testing methodology in the world, but we should catch anything obvious at least. So far so good though, and let me also try changing the height of the ray, and that seems to be working as well. So using this horizontal intersection test, we can now implement that simple algorithm we were talking about, where an even number of intersections means that the point is on the outside of the glyph, while an odd number means that it's inside. So I basically just copy-pasted our little test code here, only after calculating the roots, instead of visualizing them, we now increment a counter if the root is valid. And by valid, I mean it needs to lie between 0 and 1 to be on the curve segment, 
And we're also only interested in intersections to the right of the ray starting point, since that's the arbitrary direction I picked for the ray to be traveling. Okay, we now just need this tiny function here to loop over all the curves in the glyph, count the total number of intersections, and return whether that value is even or odd. All right, let's try it out. And isn't that beautiful? From here, I guess we basically just need to increase the number of dots and we're done. But hang on a second, what are these weird artifacts that keep appearing? And also, I'm a bit concerned that my computer is about to burst into flames. Okay, no need to panic, let's just start with the most serious issue first. Getting rid of this weird line here. So let's take another look at our visualization. Alright, it just needed a good old-fashioned restart, it appears, and we're back in business. So let me set the resolution to 100 here, which is where that issue was occurring. And I believe what's happening is just that there's obviously a meeting point of two curves over here, and this row of pixels just happens to line up precisely for both of them to be counted in this case. So in the code, I'll just change the condition for being a valid intersection to discount the very end of the curve meaning that where one curve ends and another begins, we'll only count one of them. And running this again, we can see problem solved. With that fixed, let's now tackle the performance problems. And I want to try simply moving all of our calculations into a shader so that we can compute loads of pixels in parallel. Firstly, I'm just going to try get the bounding boxes of each glyph showing up. So basically, we have this buffer of instance data, which just contains each glyph's position and size at the moment, and that gets sent to the shader. Then we're requesting that a quad mesh be drawn for however many glyphs there are in the input string. So when the shader is processing the vertices of the quad mesh, it'll be told which copy or instance of the mesh it's currently working with, meaning that we can get the data for that instance and use it to position each vertex. Here's how it's looking at the moment. This says coding adventures, by the way, in case you can't tell. To improve the readability, we'll need to get the rest of the data over to the shader. So I've been working on this little function here, which creates a big list of all the Bezier points that we need, along with a list of integers for storing some metadata about each unique glyph in the text. In particular, each glyph needs to know at what index it can find its Bezier data, as well as the number of contours that it has, and also the number of points in each of those contours. Obviously, we also need to record the index at which each glyph's metadata begins, so that we know where to find it. Not very exciting stuff, but it needs to be done, and all of this ultimately gets packed up and sent to the shader to live in these buffers over here. Another slightly tedious thing I've been doing is translating all our C-sharp code into shader language for things like the quadratic formula, intersection counting, and the point inside of a glyph test. Okay, with that done, let's try it out. And it's working. Well, mostly anyway. I don't know why the Bitcoin logo has showed up, that's just supposed to be a space. And also the eye has gone missing, but I'm sure these will be easy enough to fix. I'm more concerned about whatever's happening over here. So I'm just going to step through the different segments of the glyph to see what values we're getting for A, B, and C. And I might have known, if it isn't my old nemesis, floating point imprecision. And as you can see, everything is jiggling like there's no tomorrow. So computers tragically represent numbers with a finite number of bits, meaning that precision is limited. On this segment, for example, when we calculate the coefficient a by taking p0, adding p2, and subtracting twice p1, we should get precisely 0 on the y-axis. Except the computer begs to differ. It says it's extremely close, but not quite equal to 0. This means that when we apply the quadratic formula, we're dividing by this tiny incorrect value and getting incorrect results. <laughs> 
So we need to get a little dirty, I suppose, and just say that we'll consider our curve to be a straight line if A is very close to zero. And now those horrible little lines have disappeared. By the way, we should check if we've managed to actually improve the performance with all of this. And indeed, the computer is running a lot more happily now. Okay, after a few misadventures, I've managed to fix that missing eye and uninvited Bitcoin, and so at last we're able to properly render some text to the screen with our shader. Since we're doing this directly from the curve data, we can also zoom in pretty much to our heart's content, and it remains perfectly smooth. Well, I say perfectly smooth, but of course there are still not enough pixels in most modern displays to prevent edges from looking unpleasantly jagged, so we'll definitely need to implement some kind of anti-aliasing to improve that. I also spotted a weird flicker when I was zooming in. I'm struggling to see it again now, but here's a freeze frame from the recording. So I've been zooming in and out and panning around trying to see how common these flickers are and where they're occurring. There's another one! Did you see that? This is a bit frustrating because it only happens when the pixels perfectly line up in some way, so it's hard to capture the exact moment. In fact, it's right in the sweet spot I'd say of being rare enough to be a nightmare to debug, but not quite rare enough to just pretend it doesn't exist. So I really want to have some way of quantifying how many of these artifacts are occurring, so that I don't have to spend multiple minutes after each tweak to the code trying desperately to divine whether I've made things better or worse. So I've decided to build an evil artifact detector. What I've done is simply taken a glyph and written some code to randomly generate these little test windows. The windows in black are entirely outside of the glyph, while the windows in white are entirely inside of it. And I've run this across a bunch of different glyphs from several different fonts. The idea then is that each of these windows gets fed one by one to a compute shader, which looks at all the texels, which is to say all the pixels inside the window texture, and runs our algorithm for each of them to figure out whether they're inside the glyph or not. It then draws the result to the window texture, and also flags the test as a failure if it doesn't match the expected value. By the way, a small detail here is that I am offsetting the Y position by an increasing fraction of a texel as we go from the left to right edge of the window, because that way we're not just running the same test over and over, but rather covering a whole extra range of values, which will hopefully help us catch more artifacts. In total, it's running just over 74,000 tests, which takes about 10 seconds to complete. And our current algorithm is failing 7,166 of them, so roughly 10%. To help hunt down the issues, I've also set up this little debug view, where we can see a list of the failed cases down the side here. And each case is defined by three numbers. There's the glyph index, which we can set over here. Then the resolution index, which determines how many pixels are tested inside of the window. And finally, the window index, of course, tells us which window we're looking at. So let's go to one of the failed cases, such as 0219, and zooming in on the window, we can see this little spot over here, where it mistakenly thought that it was inside of the glyph. Now I'm going to draw in a quick debug line, so that we can then zoom out and see where exactly this issue is arising. And it appears to be this troublesome meeting point of two curves again, where the intersection is being double counted. I thought I had fixed that earlier when we told it to ignore time values exactly equal to 1, but clearly that was overly optimistic. It makes sense in theory, but as we saw recently, with every bit of maths we do, numerical imprecision has an opportunity to creep in, and so we can't exactly trust the values that we're getting. So I've been working on a dirty little fix for the double counting, where we simply record the positions of the intersections that occur on each segment, and then when we're examining the next segment, we ignore any intersection points that are extremely close to those previous ones. Alright, let's try this out, and we get a failure count of over 30,000. Okay, I see what went wrong though, we're recording the positions regardless of whether they were actually on the curve segment or not, so let me fix that quickly, and then redo the test, and this time 4,943. 
And with some trial and error, just tweaking the value of the distance threshold, I was able to get the failure count down to 3647. Alright, now I've been taking a look at some of these remaining failures, such as this one over here, and in this case we have a few spots that falsely believe they're outside of the glyph, meaning the intersection count is even when it should be odd. And looking at this, we can see we have one, two, three simple intersections, and then we avoid the double counting over here, giving us a total of four. The count is supposed to be odd though, so I guess in this particular case we actually do need to count both of these. I think because they're forming this kind of vertical wedge, so in a sense the ray is both exiting and entering the glyph at that point, meaning they cancel each other out. I'm not sure if I'm making any sense, but regardless, this whole double counting business is becoming quite annoying, so I've been brainstorming a bit how we could approach the problem slightly differently to get around it. The new plan is to forget about counting the number of intersections, but rather look for the closest intersection. The idea is that regular contours are defined in a clockwise direction, while the contours of holes go anti-clockwise, and this means that if the closest curve crosses our ray in an upwards direction, we must be outside the glyph, or inside a hole, but that's the same thing really, whereas if the closest curve crosses our ray in a downwards direction, then we know that we're inside the glyph. Now to determine which direction the curve crosses the ray, we can take our equation and just apply the power rule from calculus to figure out the gradient, which comes out as 2at plus b. Calculating that for any value t along our curve gives us this vector here, which tells us how the x and y positions along the curve are changing with respect to t. For example, over here the y position of the curve is increasing as t increases, so the gradient has a positive y value, whereas over here y is decreasing as t increases, so the gradient has a negative y value. That means we can simply check the sign of that value to find out whether the curve crosses our ray in an upwards or downwards direction. So here's the new implementation, as you can see we're simply searching for the closest point that our ray intersects, then calculating the gradient of the curve at that point, and saying we're inside the glyph if that closest curve crosses the ray in a downwards direction. Ok, let's run the test now to see how this compares, and we're getting a failure count of 1126, so not a bad improvement. There are some downsides to this approach though, for instance here's a font I was experimenting with, and we can see that the J is looking a little strange. That's due to a small mistake in the font where the contour has been wound anti-clockwise like a hole. If we were just counting the intersections, it would give the correct result regardless, but this new approach fails catastrophically. Also over here the contour contains a slight self-intersection, which again causes an issue. So that's definitely a weakness to keep in mind, but I'm going to run with this anyway since it seems promising in terms of eliminating those pesky artifacts at least. With that said, the same case we had before is actually still failing, but now it's because right at the end point, these two curves have the same position, so it doesn't know which one is closer. I think it makes sense then to favour the curve that's most on the left, since our rightwards ray should hit that first. So in the code, I've just added a quick test to see if two points are the same, or at least very near to being the same, and then if that's the case, we skip the curve that has its p1 point further to the right. And running this now, we've eliminated a few more problems, down to 1024. Alright, here is our next problem, and I'm just trying to spot the artifact here. It's quite tiny, but there it is. Ok, I'm not sure what's going on in this case, I don't even know which of these curves the ray is intersecting, so I've quickly added a way to highlight the curves of each contour by their index. And we can see here the possibilities are curves 2, 3, or 4. Now shaders can be a little tricky to debug, but we can get creative and do something like output a colour based on the index of the closest curve we found, so red if index 2, green if index 3, and blue if index 4. And now we can zoom in on our debug texture again to see which it is. And it must be our lucky day, two different problems for the price of one. So from the one spot it's hitting curve 2, and from the other, it's hitting curve 4. 
let's think first of all about the ray that's hitting curve number two. I think it's odd that our ray is able to hit that curve, but evidently miss the closer curve over here, since these endpoints are at exactly the same height. I think what might help in at least some situations like this is to test whether all the points of a curve are below our ray, and simply skip the curve in that case, and same story if all the points are above the ray. That's because these raw position values are really the only reliable thing we have, as we've seen once we start doing maths with them, all bets are off. And so by skipping curves early on based on the positions, we can avoid accidentally hitting them due to numerical issues. It would really be wise to use these positions directly as much as possible. For example, at one point I read a bit about the slug algorithm, which has this interesting way of classifying different curves based solely on the positions of their control points. This technique is patented though, so I'm just going to forge ahead with my own hacky approach instead. Alright, so running the test again with our curve skipping enabled now, we get a failure count of 882. And looking at our case from before, we can see that only the intersection with curve 4 remains. This is actually the curve that we wanted to intersect with, but since it completely flattens out over here, we must be getting a gradient of 0, which is ambiguous as to whether the curve is going up or down. However, from the fact that p0 and p1 are in a straight line here, and p2 is below them, I think we could reasonably consider this curve as going purely downwards. So in general, let's say that a curve is decreasing for its entire duration if p2 is below p0, and increasing if it's the other way around. Although this is only true of course if p1 is somewhere in between them on the y-axis. As soon as p1 becomes the lowest or highest point, the curve starts curving in both directions. And this is kind of troublesome actually, because let's say we have a ray which should theoretically intersect precisely at the turning point over here, where the y gradient is zero. Even the tiniest imprecision might cause the program to actually think it intersected a little bit behind or ahead of that point, so we could very easily end up with the wrong value. Most fonts I've come across so far actually seem to avoid using this kind of curve, but if we encounter one, maybe we could simply split it into two segments, one where it's going purely upwards with respect to t, and one where it's going purely downwards. Doing that should be reasonably straightforward. First of all, we can figure out the turning point simply by setting the y gradient to zero, and then solving for t, from which we can of course compute the actual point. Then say we want to construct this segment here that goes from p0 to the turning point. Obviously, we're going to place the two endpoints of the new curve at p0 and the turning point, but the big question is, where does the new p1 point go? Well, we need the gradient at p0 to still point towards the p1 point of the original curve in order to maintain the same shape, which means that our new p1 point is constrained to be somewhere along this line here. And where exactly is where it forms a horizontal line with the turning point, since of course the gradient there, by definition, is zero on the y-axis. So I've been writing some code to do these calculations for us automatically, and it's such a great feeling to figure out the maths for something and then just have it work perfectly the first time. Which is why I was a bit disappointed when this happened. Anyway, it turns out I just forgot some important parentheses, and while we're here let's take a quick look at the maths, which is super simple. We just say that if we start at p0 and move along the gradient vector of the original curve at p0, for some unknown distance, we're eventually going to hit a point with a y value equal to the turning point. We can then rearrange that to solve for the unknown distance, which then lets us calculate our new p1 point. And the exact same goes for the other segment, of course. And now we can see that this is working. So this can be done as a pre-processing step on the glyph contours, Though, like I said, most of the fonts I've tried actually keep the p1 points strictly between p0 and p2, so it's usually not necessary. In any case, in the shader, we can now determine if the curve is going up or down, simply based on the relative y positions of p0 and p2. Hopefully this will improve the accuracy somewhat, and running the test on this, we now have a failure count of 755.
I'm slightly underwhelmed, but it's progress nonetheless. Okay, let's keep going. The next error on our list is this one here, where this ray is managing somehow to dodge both of the segments at their meeting point. I believe what's happening is that the roots we're calculating there are just ever so slightly outside of the valid bounds, due to precision errors of course. So I've simply added in a little fudge factor to catch those cases. And running the tests again, we're now down to just 404 remaining failures. Okay, here's the next case on the list, and in this one the ray should be hitting segment 6, but after some debugging I discovered it's actually just missing it due to, you won't believe this, precision errors again, and instead hitting only segment 7. So in our quadratic formula, missing the curve means that the discriminant is negative, so let's try actually allowing it to be a tiny bit negative to catch those cases, and then just clamp it to zero in our actual calculation. This might seem pretty dodgy, but remember we are skipping curves that are entirely above or below the ray, so I don't think it will actually introduce many false positives. I am hoping it will cut down on the false negatives though, so let's run the test once again. And that's actually brought us all the way down to just 10 failed cases, which is very exciting. Be careful not to fall off the edge of your seat. So let's have a look at what remains. Alright, our ray is hitting the tip of these two segments here, and this looks very similar to a problem we dealt with earlier actually. Remember this one, where the ray was also hitting the tip of two segments, and we told it to prefer the one that had its p1 point further on the left, the idea being that a ray travelling rightwards should hit that segment first. But now we have a bit of an edge case here where the p1 point of the segment we want the ray to hit is actually not further to the left than the other segment. So I've set up this little test area with different configurations of curves to try and come up with a more robust approach, and after playing around a bit I think I have something that'll do the trick. To be clear about what we're trying to achieve, in case I wasn't making sense earlier, the problem is that if our ray is coming in and hitting the tip of these two segments, we're not getting a clear answer as to which curve it hit first. But intuitively it should be the blue curve, since if the ray was just a tiny bit lower down, then it would very clearly be hitting the blue curve first. So my thinking now is that we'll consider the gradients of the two curves at our point of intersection, and then imagine kind of winding in a clockwise direction from the ray, and seeing which gradient vector we run into first. Whichever curve that gradient belongs to is the curve we want. By the way, if the curves originate from above the ray instead of below it, like this case here, the idea still works the same, only we imagine winding in a counterclockwise direction instead. And here's that idea expressed in code. So, running the test again, we're now at long last down to zero errors, which I'm very happy to see. Obviously, scoring perfectly on the test does not mean it's perfect, in fact I'd be shocked if there are not still plenty of edge cases lurking in the shadows, but we've definitely come a long way in destroying those artifacts that were quite prevalent before. At least I've been zooming and panning around this text for quite a while, and not yet noticed a single one. I did come across a more fundamental issue while testing some new fonts though, and this arises when we have overlapping shapes, like with this particular letter K over here. We're using the closest segment to determine whether we're inside or outside of the glyph, but from over here for example the ray would hit into this as the closest segment, which incorrectly tells us that we're outside of the glyph, and so if we try rendering it, it looks like this. Thankfully though, after some contemplation, I realised that we can tweak the algorithm slightly to keep track of the closest distance to the exit of any shape that we're inside of, as well as to the exit of any hole that we might be inside of, and then by comparing those distances, we can determine whether our point is inside the glyph or not. So with that, it seems like our rendering is now working okay. However, it is definitely in need of some anti-aliasing as I mentioned before, so that it doesn't look so unpleasantly jaggedy. Currently, each pixel decides what colour to display based on whether a single point at its centre is inside of the glyph or not. So the easiest improvement I can think of would be to go from a single point deciding the fate of the pixel, 
to perhaps a grid of 9 points, each contributing a little to the final colour of the pixel. We could even get fancy and consider the fact that each pixel is of course made up of a red, green, and blue component. So over here for example, instead of just dimming all three colours uniformly, because only six of the nine points are inside of the glyph, we could say that since red and green are within the glyph, we'll just light those two up fully by outputting yellow, and leave blue turned off. This is a technique called subpixel anti-aliasing, and we can see it in action if we take a very close look at the text in my code editor for example, where along the left edge of the H for instance, we can notice how mainly just the green and blue parts of the pixel are lit up, while along the right edge here, it looks like mainly just the red part of the pixel is lit up. So this is a clever way of essentially tripling the horizontal resolution of the display. There are some subtleties to this though in terms of filtering the results so that the colour fringes aren't overly harsh, and I guess detecting and handling the possibility of different pixel layouts on different displays. So I'm actually going to leave this subpixel idea for future experiments. But here's our super simple anti-aliasing for today. We just loop over a 3x3 grid, and calculate the different sample points within the pixel. This is possible by the way thanks to this derivative function, which tells us how much the position value changes between the current pixel we're working on and its next door neighbour. In other words, it's the size of the pixel in our glyph's coordinate space. So we're just adding one for each of these points that is inside of the glyph, and then dividing by 9 to get the average of those samples. And now, instead of being all jaggedy, our edges become nicely smoothed out. This is at a very high magnification of course, just to show the effect better, it's obviously a lot more subtle in reality. And while I'm not sure how well it'll show up in the video, it definitely does make a big difference to how smooth the text feels. Nevertheless, running our algorithm 9 times for each pixel feels a bit exorbitant, so I've been experimenting with a little improvement where we actually only run it 3 times along the vertical axis, and sum up now this horizontal coverage value. Basically, instead of simply returning a boo for whether the point is inside the glyph or not, I've slightly modified our function to return a coverage value between 0 and 1. This is calculated by adding together the distance to the nearest curve segment on either side of the input point, both of which have been clamped to half the width of a pixel, and then dividing by the width of the pixel. This means that if the pixel is far away from any edge, then it will get a value of 1, meaning it's completely inside of the glyph, or inverted to 0 if we're actually outside of the glyph, and for pixels closer and closer to an edge, that value will get closer and closer to 0.5, so that we get a smooth transition between 0 and 1 across the edge. Here that is in action with our test text from earlier. And if we magnify this a bit, we can see the anti-aliasing is looking pretty decent I think. It's maybe a slightly strange implementation though, I later came across this write-up which talks about sending out the rays in different directions to estimate what fraction of this little circle is covered by the glyph, which sounds a bit more flexible and accurate, so I might use that instead in the future. In any case, what I'd like to do now is run a super quick performance test. So I'll paste in the entire 12,000 word script that I have for this video so far as the input and try running it. Alright, taking a look at the statistics, it seems to be running happily enough at around 800 frames per second, and I tried comparing the average frame duration here to that of a blank project, and it seems like the text is taking roughly 0.2 milliseconds to render, although I'm honestly not sure how to properly profile these sorts of things. The performance does fall off a cliff unsurprisingly though for very complex fonts. Here's a random font I found with lots of little wiggly details in the glyphs. This G for instance contains 440 Bezier curves, which has taken us from roughly 800 frames per second, crashing down to about 150. There are ways we could optimize this though, the obvious idea that comes to mind being splitting each glyph up into multiple bands, so that each pixel only has to test the Bezier segments inside of the band that it's in. Additionally, each glyph is currently rendered as a quad, which is nice and simple, but in a lot of cases can leave quite a bit of empty space that the shader still needs to crunch the numbers for. With a bit of pre-processing though, we could construct much tighter fitting meshes, tailored specifically for each individual glyph. 
far more challenging than improving the performance, I suspect, is improving the legibility of the text at small sizes. Right now, it's very easy to read, on my screen at least, but if I just zoom out a little more, it really starts to go downhill quite fast. Let me magnify this view so we can see the problem better, and take this word here for example. We can see how some parts of it show up nice and bright, while other parts are much dimmer, because maybe they fall awkwardly between two pixels for example, so both pixels end up just being kind of greyish. If I pan the camera slightly, we can see how the legibility of each letter actually changes as its alignment with the pixels changes, and that seems like kind of a tough thing to fix. I believe we'd need to delve into that scary bytecode interpreter stuff that I was so happy to skip in the beginning, so definitely a problem for some other day. What's still bugging me a bit though is those downsides I showed earlier to our closest curve rendering approach, namely failing if the contour has the wrong winding direction, and being very sensitive to self-intersections. So I decided to take everything I learned from that artifact hunting process, and basically start over from scratch with the counting method again. I won't bore you with another blow by blow account, but armed with a much better understanding of the problem now, I was able to quickly get it working with zero issues on the test set. A bunch of these same ideas are still in there, and the main new addition is a super simple one. It's really just a small detail in the way that curves are skipped, which actually helped immensely with the double counting issues that were plaguing us previously. Basically, when we're testing if all the points of a curve are above or below the ray, we need to decide whether we want to include zero in the test, which means skipping the curve even if one of the points is precisely at the same height as the ray. If we don't skip those cases, we get issues with double counting at the meeting point of two curves, as we've seen, while if we do skip them, then we essentially create tiny holes that the ray can sneak through at those meeting points. Of course, we could try to solve that issue by only including zero for the P2 points perhaps, since then if we imagine a contour like this, a ray that perfectly lines up at the meeting point will only intersect one of the curves. The problem though is that if the contour looks like this instead, then suddenly the ray isn't really crossing the contour anymore, it's just kind of scraping past it. So we want it to hit either neither of the curves, or both of them, so that it doesn't affect the end result. I believe it was this kind of issue that drove me to abandon the counting method originally, but now that we've processed the curves to ensure they can only go strictly upwards or strictly downwards, it suddenly doesn't seem like such a big deal anymore. The problem simply occurs when the curves are going in opposite directions, one up and one down. And so the way we can handle this in the code is to just check the direction of the current curve, and for one direction we include 0 only for the p0 points, and for the other direction we include 0 only for the p2 points. And that seems to work very nicely. Alright, so now that we're using the counting method again, we can see that the incorrectly wound j renders correctly, and the tiny self-intersection is no longer causing any visible issues. I was quite happy about this, but victory was short-lived because I then realised that this approach actually fails in the case of overlapping shapes again. Now we can fix this with a slight tweak where we say that whenever the ray crosses a downwards curve, which means that it's exiting the current shape, we add one to this counter, and otherwise subtract one if it's entering the shape. Then if the ray exited more shapes than it entered, it must have started out inside of a shape. This is essentially the same idea as the original counting method, but should be able to handle overlapping shapes. By the way, this can also be extended nicely to work with our current anti-aliasing approach like this. It's still just adding or subtracting one like before, unless the distance to the intersection becomes extremely small, like within the current pixel, and in that case we're now adding or subtracting some fractional amount meaning that in the end, we again get our nice smooth blend from 0 to 1 across the edge of the glyph. This idea comes from that write-up I mentioned earlier when we were first implementing the anti-aliasing. Anyway, as we can see, this little tweak has indeed resolved the overlapping shape issue, while unfortunately breaking the problematic J again, which is quite annoying. On the other hand, the self-intersection is looking better than ever, so I'd say we can count this as a half victory at least. I did try a couple different things to get the wonky J to render correctly, 
since it is a recurring issue that I've seen in a handful of fonts at this point, but none of my attempts came particularly close to working. This one perhaps least close of all. So maybe we could try to automatically detect faulty contours and correct them when importing the font instead. But I need to stop worrying about these little details for now, this was just supposed to be a quick experiment after all, and I may have got a little lost in the weeds along the way. Sorry about that. Anyhow, after all this, I definitely feel like I've gained a much greater appreciation for the intricacies of rendering text. Here is one last test with our latest approach on a big wall of text with several different fonts, and I think I'm happy enough with how it's looking to call it a day for now at least. So to end things off, I've just been having some fun in the vertex shader here, making the letters wave and spin around to say farewell and thanks for watching. I hope you've enjoyed following this little journey into the surprisingly deep rabbit hole of rendering text. And if you have any thoughts as to how the current implementation could be improved, I'd of course love to hear them. Alright, that's all for now though, so until next time, cheers.